Moscow, June the 24th, 1945, Hitler is defeated and dead by his own hand. The Soviets celebrate a victory won at appalling cost. They are waiting for Stalin. Generalissimo Stalin. It is Stalin's hour of triumph. He has led his countrymen to their greatest ever victory. His armies have liberated millions from Nazi rule. And he, Joseph Stalin, has been the architect of victory. The master strategist. Or so his people believe. But Stalin's most devastating victory by far has been his annihilation of the truth. Germany, 1933. Hitler becomes Reichskanzler and goes public with his plans. He rails against England, France, and the Slavs. Eastern Europe, he says, is infested with inferior peoples, while the Germans, a superior race, are suffocating for lack of Lebensraum, living space. He calls for seizure of the rich Slavic lands, together with a culling of their race, and enslavement of the Slavic peoples by the thousand-year Reich. For the second time in a generation, the fatherland resounds to the tramp of jackboots. The Soviet general staff considers war inevitable and readies its forces. It will be a new breed of war. Swift armored units will determine victory, predicts Marshal Tukhachevsky, deputy defense minister. Then, in 1936, Tukhachevsky innovates the world's first airborne unit. Together with his staff, Tukhachevsky firms up his plans. But Stalin has other plans. He will provoke a war between Hitler and the West while conserving his own forces to step in and pick up the pieces. But what of Tukhachevsky and his staff? With their influence, they could sabotage Stalin's scheme. So, with Defense Minister Voroshilov, Stalin consigns to history Tukhachevsky and his staff. Moscow, 1937. The Soviet people learn from the headlines of a military conspiracy. High-ranking traitors have confessed all. We are grateful to the NKVD for uncovering the snake pit of spies and murderers. Fascist hirelings must be wiped out. To be shot as mad dogs. Former Deputy Chief Military Prosecutor Boris Viktorov. That conspiracy was allegedly headed by the first Deputy People's Commissar for Defense, Marshal of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Nikolaevich Tukhachevsky, and a large number of responsible and high-ranking Red Army officers. It turns out that practically the entire main military council, the brains of the Red Army officer corps, was branded among the conspirators. Out of the 108 members of the military council, 98 of them were arrested and shot. Three of the five top commanders are executed. Then 90% of the military council. Marshal Tukhachevsky is tortured so brutally that his interrogation records are blood spattered. One of Marshal Blucher's eyes is plucked out and offered to him. Most family members of arrested officers are executed or imprisoned. Their children are put into orphanages. The youngest will never learn their names or the names of their parents. Altogether, 43,000 senior officers are executed in Stalin's purge.
Alexander Samsonov, historian. 43,000 officers. That was only the command staff, but reprisals were taken against the entire Red Army. From 1937 to 39, about three and a half to four million soldiers were purged. Most of them were worked to death in the labor camps. No army in the history of war has sustained such losses as those inflicted on the Red Army in peacetime by its own commander-in-chief. Der Führer is delighted by Stalin's unexpected gift. Stalin, he observes, is a hell of a fellow and beastly cruel. When I conquer Russia, I'll put Stalin in charge, Hitler says. No one knows better than Stalin how to handle the Russians. Mussolini, Hitler's junior partner, is also impressed. Stalin is a closet fascist, he says, one of our staunchest allies. With all of Europe arming for war, Stalin must now choose sides. England and France appear weak-willed and unready. The Americans are oceans away. Stalin will woo Hitler. Maxim Litvinov, Russia's ranking diplomat, supports the West. Stalin discards him and chooses Vyacheslav Molotov to make overtures to Berlin. Success. Joachim von Ribbentrop, Nazi foreign minister, comes to Moscow. The deal is struck. Their pact contains a secret protocol. The protocol is a sweetener for Stalin. Soviet-German non-aggression pact. Russo-German pact signed. Hitler has gained through skillful diplomacy what might otherwise have required force of arms. He has secured his Eastern Front. Now his destiny beckons him to war, to Poland. In 27 days, Poland is hammered to its knees. Hitler has reinvented war, and Poland is the rehearsal. Stalin now collects his sweetener, the secret protocol. In the border town of Brest, Russian and German commanders meet to partition Poland. Stalin gets the eastern half. He is confident now that his borders are safe. Hitler is too shrewd to repeat Germany's error of 1914. Hitler will never fight a two-front war. At a Moscow reception, Stalin toasts Hitler's success. As he drinks, Paris falls. But Stalin has gravely underestimated his new partner. Stalin has gravely underestimated his new partner. Dmitry Volkogonov, advisor on national security to the president of Russia. He was mistaken. There was no second front. Actually, after the Germans occupied France and took Paris, the second front in the West was eliminated. In Berlin, Hitler tells Molotov, Stalin is a master politician. He will go down in history. Molotov is fated like visiting royalty. He will convey Hitler's compliments to Stalin. Russo-German relations have never been more cordial. It is, however, a charade. Hitler has already approved plans for an attack on the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa. Reports reach the Kremlin 
but Stalin poo-poos them. Disinformation, he tells Molotov. Western agents sowing distrust. In Tokyo, Soviet military intelligence have installed one of their ace spies, Richard Sorger. He reports to Moscow that Germany will attack in the second half of June. Stalin's response? I doubt it. Having penetrated the German embassy in Tokyo, Sorga pinpoints the date, 22nd of June, 1941. It is ignored. From Switzerland, on the 21st of June, Agent Carmen confirms the date to Stalin, who scribbles on Carmen's report, he is not a source, he's a liar. Besides, Stalin's arrangement with Hitler is profitable. He ships him strategic war materials, Soviet wheat and potatoes, lead for bullets, and critical manganese. Hitler is riding high, but Soviet agent Carmen reports worriedly, I don't understand what's going on. Germany is about to attack us. Why don't you respond to my reports? Please convey this to the top authority. In Moscow, Red Army commanders Timoshenko and Zhukov advise going on full alert. But Stalin's mind is closed. Hitler, he insists, will not violate the pact. A telegram from Agent Krotky complains, never has a state known as much about an enemy as Russia knows, thanks to good intelligence. Why doesn't Stalin do something, he asks. On one such telegram, Stalin's spy chief, Beria, notes, for submitting misinformation, secret agents Yastreb, Carmen, Almaz and Verni are to be turned into camp dust. Only a few hours remain before the German invasion. As Stalin in the Kremlin holds stubbornly to his convictions, 190 divisions crouch along his thousand-mile border, including three million of Germany's finest, veterans of Poland and the Western Front. They attack, as Stalin was warned, at dawn on June the 22nd, achieving total surprise. Ten panzer divisions lead the assault. Luftwaffe bombs target the sleeping Soviets in their barracks. For thousands of sleepers, morning never comes. The Stukas pulverize the Soviet Air Force on the ground, converting it to scrap metal. In 24 hours, the Red Air Force loses 1,200 planes, most of them sitting ducks. Hundreds of tanks, thousands of field pieces, never fire a round. Whole divisions are carpet bombed. German panzers thrust 50 miles a day. The carnage is catastrophic. 28 Soviet divisions are obliterated. The Red Army is a spent force. Stalin receives the news inscrutably. The disaster is too stunning to grasp. In just eight days, German columns have stabbed 300 kilometers into the Soviet Union. Stalin did not know it yet, but on the sixth day, an officer from the general staff reporting on the situation declared the German panzer columns had been spotted east of Minsk. Imagine that, on the sixth day, east of Minsk, 
Stalin was amazed to such an extent that he was in a state of profound psychological shock. What do you mean, east of Minsk? You've got something mixed up. The officer replied, no, Comrade Stalin, the air reconnaissance photos clearly indicate the Germans are around Minsk. Stalin also saw Zhukov at the People's Defense Commissariat and gave vent to his fury at the defense leadership. After that, he returned to his residence at Kuntsevo and did not appear for more than two days. No one knew what he was doing. And only when a state defense council was set up did the Politburo in its entirety come to him. Stalin even stepped backwards because he thought they had come to arrest him, which is what he would have done in their place. The blame for this failure had to be pinned on someone. That was his method. But Molotov said, Comrade Stalin, we have set up a state defense council. You must head it, and it's necessary to act. Isolated in the Kremlin, the embattled Stalin has little cause for optimism. The beheading of his officer corps has deprived him of his most urgent need, good military minds. His schemes and intrigues are all crashing about his ears. Soon, it will be German shells. An entry in the diary of General Halder, chief of the German High Command, reads, The offensive of our forces, it seems, was totally unexpected by the enemy. The border posts across the river were taken without fighting and are fully intact. Some units were caught in the barracks with their pants down, while forward units asked their commanders what to do. In a broadcast heard nationwide, a shaken Stalin on the war's 12th day makes an emotional appeal to the Soviet people. Comrades, citizens, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, my friends. The treacherous attack by Hitlerite Germany on our homeland is continuing. Is the Soviet government at fault? Of course not. The German advance is inexorable. Stalin issues a cruel order. The Germans fear the cold, so it has to be organized that everything should be raised to the ground within 60 kilometers behind the front line and 30 kilometers either side of the roads leading to the front. Bonuses were given to the soldiers who set fire to towns and villages. Russian villages went up in flames over this large territory. Russian women with children and elderly people were the first to suffer from this, because for them, these fragile huts and shacks were their last hope for survival until the Soviet army returned. But Stalin did not care at all about that. Stalin, having bungled strategically, must now exploit his soldiers' bravery to its fullest. He orders them not to retreat, but to stand and die. The Germans exploit Stalin's cynical move. With their superior speed, they encircle the stand-fast Soviets, who fight to their last bullet and shell. Fly up! With ammunition gone and ranks wasted, surrender is their only option. More than three and a half million Soviet prisoners are taken in the first six months of the war. Their condition is heartbreaking. Stalin's response is his infamous order number 270 which brands all prisoners as traitors. An ironic judgment against men whose only fault has been to follow Stalin's orders. 
The conditions were horrible. Much of it, the fault of Stalin, who refused to subscribe to the Geneva Convention on treatment of war prisoners. Moreover, he was practicing what he said. I have no prisoners of war. I have only traitors. Such was Stalin. German Reichs Minister Rosenberg reports to Field Marshal Keitel. Of 3,600,000 prisoners, only a few thousand are able to work. The majority die of hunger or exposure, thousands of typhus. Most camps have no shelters, no protection from the rain and snow. Adding to their misery is Stalin's order, declaring them traitors. The order promises that Red Army soldiers who give themselves up will be hunted down and executed. Captured Red officers will be considered deserters. They will be hanged. Their wives and children will be imprisoned. But Stalin's order has an awkward side effect. With death waiting at home and in the camps, many change sides. Life under Hitler is sweeter than death under Stalin. This man becomes their commander. General Vlasov unites one million red prisoners of war into the Russian Liberation Army. Formerly one of Stalin's generals, he promises his soldiers not only bread, but a new Russia, free of Stalin's rule. Vlasov and the soldiers of his Russian Liberation Army earn a reputation as tough, no-quarter troops, fighting in German uniforms side by side with their former enemies against their Soviet countrymen. In two months, the panzers advance a thousand kilometers. Moscow is now threatened. His back to the wall, Stalin panics and decides to sue for peace. He picks as a go-between the Bulgarian ambassador, Ivan Staminov, and summons him to the Kremlin for a meeting. Stalin was silent. Beria was silent. Only Molotov spoke. On Stalin's behalf, he said, could you get in touch with Hitler and say that we are prepared to give Germany all of the Baltic area, a large part of the Ukraine and Belarusia, if he stops his army? Staminov was dumbfounded. But then he said, I think that even if you retreat to the Ural Mountains, Hitler will not defeat you. Leave me out of this. A heavy silence followed. Stalin waved his hand and Staminov was led away. Only one hope remains. Defend Moscow at any price with citizen soldiers. Students, professors, taxi drivers, cooks and musicians come forward to volunteer. Anyone who can pull a trigger or throw a Molotov cocktail gets a rifle. And a short course in the bayonet. Women, children, grandparents dig traps for German tanks, erect barricades, and dig trenches. Moscow's citizen army will be wiped out, but will win crucial days. By mid-October, the fall of Moscow seems inevitable. Government officers evacuate to the east. 
The city is clutched by panic. People flee the capital. Deep in the hinterlands, a vast army of Soviet citizens toils around the clock, racing time and the Wehrmacht to forge the weapons that will halt the panzers and drive out the enemy. Like frontline troops, they will make any sacrifice, not for fear of Stalin, but for love of country. Despite stiffening Soviet resistance, the German juggernaut rolls on and on towards Moscow. One man, Marshal Georgi Zhukov, stands between the panzers and the Kremlin. Stalin telephones Zhukov at his headquarters in the field. Can you hold Moscow, Stalin says. I ask you with pain in my heart. There is a long pause, then... Comrade Stalin, Zhukov replies. Moscow will hold. Stalin is torn between fleeing Moscow with the government or standing fast with the army. He chooses to stay. It will steal the hearts of Moscow's defenders, and there will be no need for the secret subterranean bunker constructed far to the east for Stalin. The city rallies. Stalin exhorts Zhukov's newly marshaled and trained troops and sends them directly from Red Square into battle. You are waging a just and liberating war. Death to the German occupation forces. Generals Zhukov, Rokossovsky and Kunyev, the Red Army explodes into action, driving the Germans back 300 kilometers from Moscow. In the dusty summer of 1942, Hitler's main thrust unexpectedly pivots away from Moscow. Instead, the long panzer columns plunge south towards Stalingrad and the oil and grain fields of the Caucasus. Hitler has done it again. He has wrong-footed his adversary. Stalin, guessing that Hitler would make a second attempt to seize Moscow, has committed his strength to the center and left his strategic Southlands virtually undefended. It is a catastrophic mistake. Stalin blames not himself, but the entire Red Army. He issues Order Number 227, announcing the formation of execution squads to shoot cowards and panic mongers. The guilty will discharge their guilt with their blood. It will inspire bravery through fear, Stalin hopes. His soldiers will fear the Germans less because they fear him more.
For those who escape execution, there are the penal detachments, the sacrificial assault units, the cannon fodder, who walk through minefields with machine guns at their backs. All serve as decoys for enemy gunners. Human wave attacks against heavily fortified positions are led by the penal detachments. In the long and bloody battle of Stalingrad, every tenth man is a penal soldier. Grigory Chukrai, academician and film director. I heard about Stalin's order number 227 for the first time when we were defending the approaches to Stalingrad and already fighting pitched battles. Stalin's threats didn't scare us at all. He said he would place special detachments behind our backs to shoot anyone who retreated. Well, we had no intention at all of retreating, and the mood of the army was already different then. Besides that, during the year of fighting, we had seen such ghastly things on the battlefield that nothing could scare us anymore. For the first time during the whole war, we learned the truth about what was really happening, and it was precisely this truth, rather than Stalin's threats, that gave rise to such great heroism at Stalingrad. Stalingrad, besieged for four months by the Red Army, is a Waterloo for the Germans. Field Marshal von Paulus capitulates, half a million starved and frozen Germans become prisoners of the Soviets. It is a turnabout for the once bronzed and confident Germans. After Stalingrad, the Wehrmacht is never again effective against the Red Army. As Soviet commander-in-chief and a maker and breaker of nations, Stalin, for all his cunning, remains a military bumbler. At Kiev, Stalin creates a fiasco. When the Germans cross the river, Stalin ignores his general's advice to withdraw to the opposite bank. 452,000 Red soldiers are killed or captured in a pincer movement. At Vyazma, Stalin runs up staggering losses, dithering while the Wehrmacht fords the river, then issuing the wrong orders. Five entire armies 600,000 men are lost to the Germans. At Kharkov in the Ukraine, Stalin demands an assault to recapture the city, disregarding all costs. It is hotly contested. The Kharkov blunder costs a quarter of a million Soviet troops. At Kerch, Stalin orders the city taken by the anniversary of the October Revolution. It is the same story. House! Anna! House! 200,000 Red soldiers are killed or captured at Kerch. But Stalin's most tragic error is Leningrad. Warned by his generals, 
to evacuate the civilians while there is still time. He does nothing. The city is blockaded. The citizens starve. Eight hundred thousand perish in Leningrad. Stalin's self-esteem, however, remains intact, and he accepts a medal, recognizing his extraordinary leadership. Meanwhile, the work of execution goes forward as Stalin's orders are carried out. In the Soviet Union, these collaborators have gone unnoticed, but now they must be exposed, and perhaps they will expose others who are hidden. Don't be afraid to report these people, even if they are relatives. Red Army begins retaking territory. Vast areas are liberated. The civilians are grateful and grief-stricken. The SS have been here. The suffering has been unspeakable. The killing and devastation, the agony, are reprisals for the people's fierce resistance. But the simple fact of their exposure to German rule has tainted them. In Stalin's mind, they are now suspect. Their eyes have been opened. Stalin issues a new order, barring these people for life from the rights of Soviet citizenship. The Germans took only three months to reach the gates of Moscow. The Russians march four long, blood-spattered years to reach Berlin. the Red Army is liberating other peoples of Eastern Europe. But it is not their hour of deliverance. They are simply exchanging one form of bondage for another. Stalin, with the consent of his allies, is making good his original plan. In the wake of an apocalyptic war, he is scavenging, stepping in to pick up the pieces. Winning the race to Berlin would strengthen Stalin's negotiating position. He orders Berlin taken. It is to be stormed, disregarding costs.
The butcher's bill is staggering. 600,000 Soviets die in the all-out effort to beat Stalin's allies to Berlin. Germany surrenders. And on the following day, a secret directive is signed by Stalin, setting up detention camps for returning Soviet prisoners. 10,000 to a camp, one million in all. They have seen too much. When I was working on my film, Clear Skies, I spoke to a man who had been a prisoner of war at Dachau. He decided that he must get home by any means, and he returned to his family. Of course, they were happy to see him because they thought he had been killed, but now he was alive. He saw his child for the first time, and in the morning, when his wife went out, two men in civilian clothes appeared. They demanded his documents, and when he had shown them, they quickly handcuffed him. He said, what are you doing? I'm no criminal. Please take off the handcuffs. They did not agree to that, and only threw the baby's diapers over the handcuffs. Then he was led away to Lubyanka prison. At the Lubyanka, they seated him by a door, and each time it opened, he was hit on the ear by a huge bronze handle. It was deliberate. So he said, what are you doing? I was not treated this way even in fascist captivity. Also, the fascists were nicer to you, they said, and they sent him to a forced labor camp. On the day of triumph, fresh Red Army battalions fling at Stalin's feet the despised Nazi banners. But Stalin has usurped this victory, stolen it from his people, the women and children, the resistance fighters, the soldiers, and the workers who fought bled, starved, and died, not for Stalin, but for their homeland. All were his victims. Stalin's only conquest was his conquest of the truth. Germany lost five and a half million men on the Eastern Front. Stalin's stolen victory cost the lives of 27 million of his countrymen. Join a scientific search for sea serpents on Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World.